Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the 29th Annual Colloquium of Pensions and Retirement Research. I'm hosted by CEPA and the School of Risk and Actuarial Studies at the University of New South Wales. My name is Hazel Bateman. I'm a Deputy Director at CEPA and a Professor in the School of Risk and Actuarial Studies. Before we begin proceedings, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the country throughout Australia and their continuing collection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Since this is a virtual event, I encourage you to include the lands you are on, if you know, in the chat function. I am currently on Bedigal land. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to CPAR Director, Scientia Professor John Piggott, who will deliver the opening remarks. John. Thank you, Hazel. My name is John Piggott and I'm the Director of, the, uh, of CPAR uh, and I'm also a Professor of Economics at, in uh, UNSW. Um, I would like to uh, welcome you all, join Hazel in welcoming you all. It's a very distinguished group that we have. We have more than 130 people registered uh, in this conference for the next three days. And this is a conference which is now in its 29th year. So it has a quite a, quite a, a substantial longevity. It's supported by both CEPA and the School of Risk and Actuarial Studies in the UNSW Business School. Um, and over the last two decades, it's really been developed into something that is a significant global event each year by Hazel Bateman. So Hazel's partially introduced herself, but she's also the inaugural president of the International Pensions Research Association. She's chair of the NETSPA Scientific Council. She serves on the advisory board of the Mercer Institute for the Global Pension Index has a number of other positions, which really place her at the center of superannuation and pensions research, both in Australia and globally. And she has a very active research agenda as well, which is around the role of choice and information architecture. Um, this conference over the next three days, its title is Financing Retirement uh, in the 2020s and beyond. Uh, there are more than 50 presentations altogether. There are a number of plenary sessions, and in a few minutes, we will go to the first of those, which will be on financing aged care. There will also be a, a panel on uh, the retirement income covenant. And then I mentioned that Hazel was president of the of IPRA, the National Pension Research Association. They will be running a, <clears throat> running a special uh, event uh, on Friday evening that um, is connected uh, to this as well on the global experience of financing retirement. So before I turn to uh, this particular plenary, opening plenary session, there are just a few housekeeping matters. Uh, it's quite important because we have a substantial number of people online to mute your microphone when uh, you're not speaking. Um, uh, and when you are visible, Make sure you are well lit and present your good side to uh, the viewing audience. Um, and please give your name and affiliation before you join uh, a conversation. So if you ask to comment or you uh, wish, to, wish to comment on a, on a particular topic, please give us your name and affiliation. Um, there'll be time for questions after each talk, um, sometimes at the end of the session, sometimes uh, along the way. Um, and um, if you have questions or comments, you can write them into the chat uh, and the session chair will facilitate uh, and mediate those questions. The sessions will be recorded, the relevant part of the presentation, excluding the Q&A discussions uploaded onto the website uh, in the weeks after the conference. So now let me turn to today's uh, um, first session. So it is going to be chaired by Mark DeCure. Uh, Mark has been involved with CPAR really since we dreamt it up at the turn of the century. Um, and he's been 
invaluable in developing SIPA. He's at the core of its strategy, and he has provided enormous impetus to the way in which SIPA has developed. He's um, uh, the advisory board chair at SIPA. He's a professor in the, uh, an adjunct professor in the UNSW Business School, uh, and has had a stellar business career, including very senior roles with both AMP uh, and AIA. And he was also uh, a senior PwC partner, chairing its Australian financial services practice and leading its Asia Pacific risk management practice. So without further ado, uh, let me turn the podium over to Mark. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that kind introduction and welcome everybody to this first plenary session on aged care financing. Aged care and financing are not necessarily our favourite topics or the thing, first thing we want to talk about, but they're two very, very important questions that will confront many of us. Um, and many of you may have already had to confront it with your parents or grandparents and experienced aged care, possibly had to help them navigate the complexities of choice, model, facility, government funding and personal finance, which for those who have been there is a very complex and emotional issue and one to be avoided in a hospital car park. Um, the increasing demand for aged care as population demographics ages and the huge uncertainties about individual needs, but a fairly higher level of certainty about collective needs, coupled with changing individual expectations and budgetary constraints, both individual and government, will throw aged care funding and choice into centre stage over the next 30 years. We cannot assume that governments will continue to foot the bill, and at least not to the same extent it does today, and we cannot continue with the underfunding and all the consequences that has for both employees and residents or recipients. Today, we have some excellent complimentary speakers in Dr. Um, uh, Professors Radcliffe, um, uh, David Cullen and Bridget Brown, and Mike Sherris. Um, each of those speakers, well, at least David and Mike will speak for 20, 20 minutes each, and uh, uh, David Cullen, Bridget Brown will share 20 minutes. Following each of those 20 minute sessions, we'll have five minutes of questions just focused on those presentations. And at the end, if I chair this well, we'll have a further 10 minutes for a general discussion across the topic, because a lot of the issues and themes come together and they all take a different perspective. So um, use the chat function with that in mind. Thank you. Um, our first speaker today is Professor Julie Radcliffe, and she'll be discussing uh, the topic of the preference for quality, Australians willingness to pay for home and residential care. A key question is what are people prepared to pay? Professor Radcliffe is Matthew Flinders Fellow and a Professor of Health Economics in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences at Flinders University. And she holds honorary professional positions at. Glasgow and Sheffield Universities. She's extensively published in peer reviewed journals and been the chief investigator in a lot of research grants. Her research in interest includes the measurement and evaluation of health and quality of life outcomes, patient and consumer preference and economic evaluation of interventions across health and social care sectors. So it's sort of front and center with, with aged care. Um, so with that introduction, I will hand over to you, Professor Radcliffe. So thank you very much for the uh, warm introduction. I'd just like to start by acknowledging uh, the Ghana people, the traditional owners of the land on which um, I'm coming from you today and to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, a programme of work that we uh, recently undertook for the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety. And we were really focusing on um, the views and preferences of the Australian general public around uh, the quality of Australia's aged care system and also future funding of the system. Okay, so um, we're, we're, I'm sure we're all aware that the Royal Commission um, really put a spotlight on Australia's aged care system, a global spotlight on that system. Um, and um, a number of fundamental concerns were raised during the proceedings of the Royal Commission about the quality of, of, of aged care. So as a health economist, I've had a long-standing interest in older people and um, research in aged care, um, because I'm highly conscious that 
um, aged care is inextricably linked to the health system. So quality in aged care service delivery really has an inextricable link to, um, the, to the health system. Um, and if we can improve the quality of Australia's aged care system, then that will have, I'm sure, um, large benefits for the health system as well in terms of the avoidance of uh, distress and suffering for older Australians, but also unnecessary and unplanned um, emergency department presentations and hospital um, hospital presentations. And, and that inextricable link, as you can see from the quote that I won't read it out there from uh, past president um, Tony Bartoni of the AMA, uh, really illustrates that inextricable link between uh, the, the aged care system and the healthcare system. So as I'm sure, um, you know, everyone will be aware that aged care in Australia is a, is a, is a big industry. It's a multi-billion billion dollar industry. And the Royal Commission estimated that in 2018, 2019, approximately $27 billion um, was uh, utilized to, to, in terms of public and private contributions to, to, to finance Australia's aged care system. And of that, approximately 75% is public funding, essentially through income tax contributions, 21% through individual co-payments at the point of needing to access um, aged care services, either in your own home or in a residential care facility, and 4% from other sources. Um, and it's certainly my view, and I, I, I'm sure it's a view that's widely shared, that public accountability and transparency is critical in terms of the way in which this expenditure is utilised, and also uh, in terms of uh, a reporting of that expenditure and also quality assessment. Okay, so to get on to the work uh, that we undertook uh, for the Royal Commission then, so we really focused on the general public's views around quality and funding of aged care, um, and we, um, we designed a survey um, which had four main sections to it. Um, and the survey was um, pre-piloted through a series of cognitive testing interviews, some of which I actually undertook, um, with people in the general community, a wide variety of backgrounds, a wide variety of ages. And we also piloted it with around 50 people prior to the main survey administration. Um, so in terms of the four main sections, and I'll touch on um, each of these in the presentation today, the first section comprised a series of attitudinal questions um, about um, the aged care system in Australia and the funding of aged care in Australia. The the second section uh, comprised a discrete choice experiment, um, and I won't talk too much about that because I'm going to present it um, in the interest of time. Um, the third section was a willingness to pay section, which I'll focus on um, in detail today, which focused on um, the general public's preferences and views about individual co-payments at the point of needing to access aged care, so fees essentially, and future funding uh, through uh, income taxation. And then finally, a series of socio-demographic -demo questions um, and questions about uh, the person's exposure to aged care services. So we surveyed over 10,000 um, survey respondents um, throughout Australia um, through Quality Online Research, which is a survey, a panel survey company. Um, in terms of eligibility criteria, the person needed to be aged 18 years of over, able to read and respond in the English language, which was a, a constraint, it's always a constraint, but obviously, um, you know, uh, there's only a, a certain amount of funding for these, this sort of work, and we didn't, ha unfortunately, have the funding to be able to undertake multiple translations of the survey. Um, and the person um, was required to have have no personal experience of accessing aged care services themselves. And this was mainly because the Royal Commission undertook separate work, which was focused exclusively on older people receiving aged care services in home and residential care. So this was the general public not currently accessing aged care services that we were focusing on in this particular project. And demographic quotas were applied to ensure representativeness by age group, sex and state or territory of residence. Okay, so um, we, we were charged by the Commission to initially undertake a comprehensive literature review to really find out what are the key indicators in terms of the previous literature in Australia and also internationally that might define quality in aged care. And when we're thinking about quality, we've, we're thinking about it, um, and this is a, a, a sort of requirement for the Commission, that it should be generic elements of quality, so not specifically focused in resi care or in home care, but 
generic elements of quality of care that could be universally applied across Australia's aged care system. So we conducted a comprehensive literature review. Uh, we went back over the past 10 years um, of grey and, um, and peer reviewed literature, um, focusing on uh, elements um, that were identified as being important to older people and family carers in aged care services in terms of how they would define quality of care and or person centred care. Um, and what we essentially uh, did through that process, through the literature review, and then we had a series of consultations with our advisory group, project advisory group, which comprised not only the research team, but also um, key stakeholders from the aged care sector, so aged care service provider representatives and also aged care consumers. And through all that process, basically distilled it down to six key attributes of quality of care. And these were also informed by the aged care quality standards, which I'm so sure you, you, uh, some of you will be very familiar with from the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. So the six key attributes were, I'm treated with respect and dignity. I'm supported to make informed choices about the care and services I receive. I receive care and support from aged care staff who have the appropriate skills and training. I receive services and supports for my daily living that are important for my health and well-being. I'm supported to maintain my social relationships and connections with the community and I'm comfortable lodging complaints with confidence that appropriate action will be taken and these six uh, key dimensions essentially form the six key attributes in the discrete choice experiment that I'm going to focus on I believe shortly if not imminently um, and we had five um, key levels attached to each of these attributes uh, essentially affecting the extent to which these attributes were achieved, ranging from never um, to, to always. Okay, so um, this is an, a, an example question from the discrete choice experiment, uh, which comprised section B of the survey. So we asked our general public respondents to respond to a series of um, eight of these uh, different choices with different levels attached to each of these key characteristics. So what we asked them to do was to imagine that they were um, an older person um, and at the point of needing to access aged care services, and they were given a choice between two different um, aged care services providers, provider A and provider B, with different characteristics in terms of the extent to which each of these key quality of care um, dimensions or domains is achieved. So imagine you're given a choice between uh, these two providers, which one uh, would you be most likely to choose? Um, and then once the choice was made, so um, if I were presented with this choice and let's say for um, argument's sake, I chose provider A, then what would happen is that the characteristics of provider B would disappear on the, uh, on the computer screen. You would be left with the characteristics of provider A. And then you would be asked a supplementary question, which is thinking about provider A and the characteristics uh, of it, the quality characteristics associated with that provider, how would you rate their overall quality of care um, on a simple Likert scale from unacceptable to very high? So we, we asked each person to make multiple choices, eight choices in total, and rate their chosen provider with the characteristics associated with it on this, on this particular uh, quality rating scale. Okay, so I apologize if this is a little bit uh, small. It's certainly small for me without my glasses on. So <laughs> I do apologize about that. But this, this basically the results in terms of the um, sociodemographics. Um, so you can see um, broadly representative, as I mentioned previously, in terms of age groups, also gender um, and um, state or territory of residence. Um, and um, yeah, probably uh, a little bit overrepresented as often we find with these types of online surveys in terms of people who are more highly educated um, and possibly by income. Um, but I don't know that we have the data to be able to make really good comparisons there. Um, okay, so um, this is some of the sort of key findings from um, the, uh, the work that we conducted. So we asked um, our general public SAS, uh, sample about um, their current understanding of Australia's aged care system. And what we found was that probably um, around 65 to 70% across all age groups from um, the youngest person in our survey was 18 years old. The oldest person was actually 91 years of age. So very broad age range across all age groups and across all um, uh, 
all genders, we found that um, 65 to 70% indicated that they understood Australia's aged care system at least somewhat um, fairly well or very well. Okay, so um, for those people who indicated that they understood the system um, fairly well or very well, we asked them some supplementary questions about the extent to which um, Australia's aged care system was currently successful in, ach in achieving some of these key, um, what we might think of as key quality of care characteristics. So you can see that um, I've highlighted in bold that for each of these statements, so the extent to which older people are treated with respect and bit dignity, the extent to which older people feel safe and com comfortable receiving aged care services, and um, aged care staff have skills and training needed to provide appropriate care and support. Um, the, 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 the majority, probably around 60-70% um, on average, felt that uh, those characteristics were uh, being achieved only sometimes, rarely, or, or not at all with um, um, uh, a minority indicating that they felt they were always or often being achieved. Okay, so we then asked uh, a series of attitudinal statements really uh, related to the funding of aged age, age care in Australia. So um, the government should provide more funding for aged care. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, we found that almost 90% of our survey respondents either strongly agreed or agreed that that should be the case. Um, but then when we ask um, the respondents about their willingness to pay more tax, to ensure Australians are able to access aged care services when they need them. You can see that the picture is quite a bit more mixed. So uh, probably just under 50% um, or so, so approximately half of the sample either strongly agreed or agreed with that statement. 34% uh, neutral, so neither agreed nor disagreed and around 16, 17% uh, disagreed or strongly disagreed. Similarly, um, when we asked uh, whether Australians, sorry, that's not similarly, it's different. So I do apologize, number four similarly. Uh, number three is different. So Australians should contribute towards the funding for the aged care services that they receive in line with their ability to pay. We found a reasonably good agreement with this. This is around the sort of co-payment co question, which we know um, approximately 21% of Australia's aged care system is fund funded through uh, co-payments or co-contributions. Uh, just under 70% either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement and then the final statement i would be willing to pay more tax to improve the quality of aged care services being provided to older australians um, again you can see a, a bit of a mix back similar to statement number two um, with around uh, 50 percent either agreeing or strongly agreeing uh, 30 34 percent neutral um, and and the remainder uh, disagreeing or strongly disagreeing with that particular statement Okay, so um, we then um, moved on in our survey to uh, focus only on um, the income taxpayers. So um, approximately, uh, I think it was around two thirds of our sample indicated they were current income taxpayers, which is, well, you guys would know a lot more about this than I do. Um, um, but um, I think that's in line with it, roughly in line with the general population, because we had a lot of um, younger people who were students, for example, or low income earners who weren't necessarily paying in tax. Plus, we had a lot of retirees who were no longer paying income tax. So of the, um, the so so we initially asked people you know are you a current income tax payer if you were then we asked these supplementary questions initially we asked a simple yes no question would you be willing to pay more in the form of um, increased income tax contributions to uh, to, to 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 ensure um, a satisfactory level of quality aged care in the first instance for all Australians in in need and uh, secondly um, we asked a follow up question about the high level of quality aged care. Um, so this is a bit of a tricky part of the question, but it came, it, sorry, of the survey, but it came after the discrete choice experiment. So we, we specifically asked the respondents to think back to the discrete choice experiment section that they just completed and what they considered as um, a satisfactory level of quality care and what they considered as a high level of quality care, you know, according to those quality ratings when thinking about answering this question. So the first question is satisfactory level of quality aged care. You can see from this table that approximately 
61% of our sample indicated, yes, they would be willing to pay uh, at least some additional income taxation, um, so you can think of it like an aged care levy, to support um, quality, satisfactory uh, level of quality yeah. aged care for all older Australians in need. Um, and of that- Only two minutes, two minutes. Okay, only got two minutes. Okay, oh yeah. gosh, I'll have to speed up, sorry. Um, well, you can see that, uh, you can see the results there. So um, on average, uh, we found that uh, our sample were willing to pay one, 1.4% additional um, taxation to support satisfactory level of quality aged care. And the 54% uh, who indicated they would put, pay uh, more tax for higher level quality aged care were willing to pay an extra 1.7% income tax beyond the 1.4%. So 3.1% additional income tax in total to fund high level quality aged care for all older Australians in need. Okay, so um, I might just skip through skip through uh, that slide in the interest of time because I just want to get on quickly to uh, willingness to pay co-contributions. So we asked a series of questions similarly framed around willingness to pay co-contributions for satisfactory home care. Uh, in terms of quality for the person themselves at the point of needing to access and high level home care. Um, and so uh, what you can see here is that um, um, you can see around 80% uh, were willing to pay um, to uh, receive satisfactory quality home care um, and 60, just over 60% willing to pay to achieve a, a high level quality home care. Um, for residential care, numbers were somewhat lower, 64% for satisfactory residential care and 45% for high level residential care. Um, and I suspect um, this was partly, uh, uh, we found a lot of older, a lot of people in the general community as it's well documented, um, really expressed a strong preference to avoid entering residential care at, at, at any cost really. So possibly we have a proportion of people who just didn't really want to go there in terms of thinking about needing to pay to, to access residential care because they had a really strong preference to remain at home. And you can see there the mean willingness to pay values. I won't go through them uh, two separate, um, including the zeros um, and, and, and for those who only expressed a positive willingness to pay. Um, that's uh, sort of the same data presented uh, in a figure format, just to show the distributions across the age ranges in terms of how much uh, people are willing to pay. And we just to say we used a payment type card approach with various um, values, so ranging from 75% to um, more than 450 sorry, $75 to more than $450. And, and um, if it was more than $450, then we asked people to indicate an, an absolute uh, maximum they would be willing to pay. Um, I'm probably going to have to skip through this, um, but similar concept with residential care. We did provide information in the survey about what residential care currently costs roughly in terms of uh, co-contributions for people at different levels of income because it's means tested. Um, the reason why we did this is we felt that we're probably, and David Cullen could probably speak to this too because he was a really helpful advisor to this project. We felt people might not have a good understanding about what residential care actually costs and a sort of a good understanding that you were paying you know for more than the care there's an accommodation component to it as well so we did give them a base level from which to to um to express their preferences um, in the residential care context. Um, I'll probably just skip through that. Um, and just the final slide. So um, we found there was a strong agreement amongst me members of the general public about what constitutes quality in aged care, regardless of age, uh, gender, or state or territory of resident. Um, and essentially the salient characteristics cons consistently rated as highly important were largely effective of what we're calling care fundamentals, the fundamentals of care. Overall, we found more positive willingness to pay values. Um, this is in terms of co-contributions and um, income tax contributions for those with who had some experience of Australia's aged care system. Uh, younger people, those with a higher income um, and having private insurance uh, and also being a current income tax payer. Um, I've mentioned about people, more people willing to pay a high co-contributions uh, for home care rather than resi care. And I think that's because there's a preference away from resi care. Um, and um, I probably just mentioned limitations. Obviously, this is a hypothetical survey, so uh, we can't in any way rule out hypothetical bias um, and that stated willingness to pay values would not actually uh, represent 
revealed willingness to pay values at the time of, of needing to access care. Um, but overall, we think it's an interesting study. I was delighted to be asked by the Royal Commission to conduct the work, um, and it was great fun. <laughs> if only we could do this sort of work all the time, I'd be so happy. Um, and the providings provide an important and timely societal perspective to inform aged care policy in Australia and in other countries, we believe, which share similar values, aspirations and circumstances. And thank you very much. <laughs> Um, but thank you very much, Julie. It was a very interesting presentation, and I'm sure you know we could have filled a lot longer time. But the, the report's there for everybody. Our next, um, our next group of speakers is um, Pat will discuss the need for long-term care, for long-term funding of aged care, um, rather than leading to the demands of the budgetary cycle and the capabilities of individuals. And I think this is a really important question and one we were touching on there. David Cullen will kick off. David is the NDIS Chief Economist and is a Senior Advisor of the Royal Commission on Aged Care and Quality. Um, and he'll also be joined with by Bridget Brown, who's a partner at Ernst & Young and a Senior Lecturer at ANU, providing actuarial and consulting advice to government and health and human services area. So to both of you, um, I hand over for your 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay, I'd just like to thank Julie. Um, we were very pleased to commission her work. I know the commissioners were very grateful for the work um, which is very high calibre. Um, I just need to start by making it clear that whatever I say today, but also Julie is not the views of the commissioners. The commissioners have stated their views in their report and they think the report's going for itself. Um, they're not also what we say today the views of either of our employers, especially not my employer. Um, we acknowledge the Nungawa people who live on the land that we live. Now, look, the basic message that we want to give today, or at least I want to give today, is that Unfortunately, the most revolutionary recommendations in the Royal Commission have received no coverage whatsoever, and where they have received some, they've been poorly understood. And so we want to talk about um, that set of recommendations. But I will do the public policy bit at the beginning of this, and then um, even though I'm a mathematician, I'll turn over to my, my colleague, the actuary, to do the numbers after that. Okay, so where did the Commission start? Or if I begin in um, dialectic terms, um, what we're going to do today is talk about neglect. Then I'll ask why it's so and what's to be done about it. And then um, my colleague will do the practices on how we're going to fix the problem. So why neglect? Too many people wait for too long to get the care that they need. But it's a bit worse than that because it really doesn't work very well at all. Um, people who need very high-level cares and need wait 36 months and a large number of them are dead before it arrives if they want to get care at home. But moreover, the people who need the most care wait the longest, which is a rather strange way to run something like a health system. Um, and the care, when you do get care, you hardly get any care. If you live at home, the average care that you get per day is 30 minutes. If you've got the highest intensity care, you get an hour, um, which is not very much if you've got very high, if you would otherwise be essentially in residential aged care. And the studies show that at least half of all homes have insufficient staffing. We also had a vast number of measures of metrics of bad quality. Half the people are malnourished. Three quarters of them have um, are incontinent. Um, a third of frail people have bed sores. These are not the sort of things one would want um, in a quality system. What was most stunning, and this is what the chair of the commission would say, is that we don't know. And that's what mo is most amazing about our system. We simply could not form a view as to how bad the quality was because the relevant data is not collected in a systemic way. Okay, so that was the problem that was identified by the Royal Commission. Why is it so? Well, it's so because of a series of deliberate government decisions. And in quick, in quick um, series, you have to understand the history of aged care in Australia is the history of a series of decisions of government about how much it's willing to spend. And those decisions were almost always made as sort of second best options. Um, we invented, yeah, we had the age pension and that was all that we did for Australia, older Australians for the first half of the 20th century. And remember the age pension in Australia was based on principle as stated by the, foreign, the treasurer who introduced it, that no one's to get an age pension if they don't need it. And they're to get the minimum possible. But that age pension then came under lots of pressure over the years. In the early 50s, 60s, um, there was a lot of pressure on accommodation issues for older people. 
there was a lot of pressure to increase the age pension to solve those problems, but instead the government decided that it would have a targeted capital program. And that's essentially where the government began to finance what were then called nursing homes. In the 60s, we came into the same problem. Again, people couldn't afford to go to nursing homes. They couldn't afford to pay the fees. So there was pressure to increase the age pension. The government said, well, let's not increase the age pension for everyone. Let's pay fees to nursing homes. There was also the issue that those who couldn't get into a nursing home were piling into hospitals where they were costing the government something like four pounds a day. So the government invented a new form of hospital called a nursing home where it paid a pound a day, half the price that it was willing to pay elsewhere. Um, then, you know, we've gone through a process and I'll, I'll talk about this later, but we kind of missed a democratic mo de demographic moment when essentially the 85 population began to be the problem in Australia, and we, we've left that behind, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that now. Um, so this chart here is a chart which we did for the Royal Commission, which essentially shows that spending, everybody concentrates on the green line, which is the share of GDP spent on aged care, which is basically growing exponentially. Um, but the share of GDP per person spent on each person in aged care or on the 80 plus population, a demand population, which is the red line here, is essentially decreasing, which is a rather strange thing to happen in an affluent country because as you become more affluent, you should start to buy more luxury goods. So if anything, one would expect the share of GDP per person spent per person in aged care to increase um, as a country becomes more wealthy, but it hasn't, this decreased. And this is essentially, come about for two specific population, two specific government decisions. One was to grow aged care at the 70 plus population, even though demand was growing the 85 plus population and the 80 plus population was growing faster than the 70 plus population. And the second was since the mid 1990s, a cabinet decision which essentially imposed an efficiency dividend, a yearly deficiency dividend on aged care and all other common and purpose outlays, which meant that, you know, you know Unit payment in aged care didn't raise at the same level as efficient cost for labor. So, um, and this was not, don't, don't think that this was done accidentally. Um, the, cab, the Royal Commission discovered a cabinet memo from 1997 in which the Department of Health basically told government, don't worry, if costs get out of control, we can apply quotas, we can keep applying an efficient dividend, or we can change the service provision benchmarks, which is code for we can reduce quality standards. Um, now, the Commission doesn't criticise um, the government for having done this, nor does it criticise the bureaucrats for having made those decisions. This is public policy working as it does. What the Commission, or at least what the Chair of the Commission wants to do is create a world in which those decisions are not possible. But essentially, what was the result of those um, conditions. Um, the work I did for the Commission essentially showed that today funding is 50% less than what it would have been if those decisions hadn't been made. So if you want to know why there's bad quality in aged care today, you look at that $9.8 billion and imagine what you could have done with staffing or with the quality of aged care if you'd been spending that on aged care as well. Um, and you know, the, the Commission found a quote, it's, I'm quoting it here, but it found a specific finding that the poor quality that we currently find in aged care is caused by that lack of funding and those decisions made by government. So that is the question as to why it's so. Then the question that the Commission wanted to ask is, what's to be done about this? And I have to acknowledge that this is not a position which the Commission has agreed on. They had a two different views. One wanted an incremental view which used current um, mechanisms um, and just tried to run harder. Um, the chair of the commission, um, Tony Pagoni, um, was seeking a revolutionary solution, and that's the solution we're talking about today. Um, but, I mean, let's think about older people. The problem with older people, as you know, is that they're expensive. Um, older people, we estimate, account for about, well, more than a fifth of all government expenditure. Um, still a fair amount of it on income support, but healthcare and aged care are growing as shares of that. Healthcare is mostly driven is growing, but healthcare is not mostly driven not by demographics, but by health technology. So I concentrate on the income support and the aged care. And of course, tax expenditures on older people are, are high as well, some of the highest. Other than the personal home, um, the biggest tax exemptions, um, the biggest tax expenditures in the, in the Commonwealth system are on um, superannuation. Of course, that's a good thing, as I'll talk about in a moment. 
Um, you know, what the problem is, and this is understood to all of you, I mean, obviously, is that the generations don't match. So at the same time as the working population is growing smaller compared to the aged care population, and that's something which has been happening considerably over the last 40 years, but even more over the next 40 years, um, that doesn't match well with the fact that all the tax is paid in the middle years. So the tax payment population is essentially not growing at the same shape, um, at the same timing as the spending population. And so what the chair of the commission was looking for was a solution which would make you know, the revenue available to fund aged care grow at the same rate as the population that was spending that aged care, and that means you need to shift generations. Now, this should not be a surprise to any of you because this is the, this is the solution which was found in retirement income 20 years ago. And we seem to have a, that, um, and this is what I mean. If you look at here, the blue line is um, spending on the pension. And essentially, government solved the retirement income problem to its budget a long time ago. Um, and it solved it through superannuation and through the tax concessions and essentially moved generations. So now, in essence, each generation pays for its own retirement. And that's why the blue line goes flat and is starting to go down. Um, in terms of direct expenditure. Government hasn't yet solved the aged care problem because at the moment the wrong generation is paying for aged care. And aged care is growing rapidly. Um, and as you can see, and this is, the, I only did this chart the other day, this is the first time I've actually seen this cross, but you know, by the time we get out past 2050, aged care will pass the aged pension under current um, expenditure um, trades. And you can see that aged care has got none of the shape that the age pension has here. It is in no way under control. So government expenditure is out of control. It's driven by the wrong generation. How do we fix this? So. David, you're the about past the halfway point, just yeah. letting you know for timing. Yep, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, the chair of the commission's views essentially are that the way to solve this problem is to get go government out of the funding of aged care. Um, government's face budget choices, um, Aged care expenditure isn't like other expenditure governments make. It's not like employment expenditure or health expenditure. There's no investment. There's no infrastructure return. There's no economic growth comes out of aged care expenditure. Um, and it's always going to have other priorities. So the chair of the commission wanted to move aged care out of that by establishing an independent financing mechanism and also an independent governance mechanism, which would then control that financing and the system itself. Um, there are other ways to think about the financing. We can think about means testing, um, et cetera. But, you know, the commission, the chair of the commission came down with a view that social insurance or social insurance aided by private insurance is a, a much more efficient way to go than, than, um, than means testing after the fact. Um, uh, we have some financing principles, which you'll be able to see in the paper afterwards that were developed by the principal. But I'll now hand over to my colleague, Richard, to talk about how we actually then implement the idea of how we move the pressure to the right generation for funding the space generation. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, and look, I also, uh, like Julie, want to express my gratitude to the Royal Commission for the opportunity to explore this issue, which I think is one of the most interesting and, and challenging sort of actuarial financing uh, questions. And I and we'll hear more from um, Mike Sherris around this as well. Um, the way we approached it was um, initially there was a consultation paper which asked for, which I think probably many of you um, were aware of or, and or contributed to um, around some of these challenges and choices. Um, and then um, because I, I know I won't have time and I don't really want to go through all the detail in this presentation, um, all the findings are summarised in, um, in the relevant chapter in the Royal Commission report for those who want to um, get into more detail and, um, and potentially contribute to the ongoing um, discussion uh, around where this might go. Um, but as you can see, what we landed on out of those choices in terms of, um, you know, the current system being um, funded, the public components being funded out of general revenue, um, the private components being funded uh, through a variety of means, um, but particularly the means testing um, application, we moved towards what was called a hypothecated aged care levy. And so 
in the context of that levy, we, we certainly ran into, similar to what Julie reported, a lot of confusion around um, exactly, you know, what, what would it mean, who was covered when, uh, who would pay when, um, what did social insurance, you know, what are the characteristics of a, of a social in, insurance scheme? And in particular, one of the biggest challenges was uh, contrary to what we've done with our superannuation system on the private savings component, the challenge of if people started contributing now to pay for their own aged care costs some 40 or 50 years in the future, it would take 40 or 50 years until we had, for example, a fully funded scheme. So between the options of a pure pay as you go, um, out of uh, recurrent revenue through to a, what you might call a fully funded, um, almost individualized scheme. We landed on a, what we called a long run pay as you go system. And um, in fact, we were not the first to make this suggestion. It has been, if you look back in the history of the previous aged care reviews, it has been suggested in the past. Um, and the main benefit of this system is that you can start raising money and making contributions immediately. And what you're effectively doing, as, as um, David highlighted in his previous slides, is it's effectively a smoothing mechanism uh, around some of this timing mismatch between uh, when you are uh, generating revenue and when you actually need the um, need the expenditure. Um, and contrary to uh, pure pay as you go or the, the general uh, consolidated revenue funding we have at the moment, it would introduce some transparency around what aged care actually costs so that society could make a collective decision about um, how they would pay for it um, and, and have that transparency which is missing from our system today. Um, so as part of that, we then looked at possible revenue bases and um, out of the taxation revenue bases, we did focus on income tax for the purpose of this exercise, but we're also considering, you know, the relationship to corporations, tax and other sources. Um, one of the key features of uh, a long-term levy system and the key benefits is that active monitoring. Um, and again, that active monitoring um, of what's happening with both the, the revenue and the expenditure side, hopefully would, or the intent there is to allow for uh, faster reaction and adjustment to the scheme, rather than um, some of what um, emerged over the last sort of 20, 30 years where uh, the deteriorating situation wasn't really fully understood um, until things like Royal Commissions come along. And we also spent quite a lot of time, um, and it was a very interesting modelling exercise, introducing that progressivity uh, into the levy, uh, such that it reflected the progressivity of our existing income tax um, system. And there's, there was, what we found was there's quite a few different ways to approach this, and, and I think there's more work to be done. And in fact, the Commissioner did recommend that more work be done in this space. Um, and as you're all aware, this is one of the recommendations that government didn't adopt, um, but that doesn't mean there isn't more work to be done. And, and I certainly invite those um, in the academic um, arena looking for research topics. I think there's a lot more to be, um, to be done here. Um, so, as I said, I actually don't want to spend a lot of time on the details. Um, you can see here, reasonably complex model. I don't want to understate the complexity. The detail is again in the chapter. Um, the complexity of our current aged care expenditure. So this was actually uh, similar to Julie. We were really just looking at the current elements of the system and the forecast future expenditure. But as you can see, it is um, complex. Uh, we did look primarily at the current public contributions, um, although we also looked at incorporating the current consumer contributions. Um, and as you can see, as the Commission was, uh, the Royal Commission team was exploring these possibilities, we had the possibility 
the um, ability to go through a wide variety of scenarios, um, including things related to when should people start paying. So perhaps those only those um, over a certain age, like 40, uh, very conscious of the imposition on younger um, younger people, uh, their taxation uh, burden is already relatively high and they have a number of other impositions on their, on their income. Uh, um, Richard, and you've then, got um, about 60, 70 seconds. Just 60, 70 seconds. Well, so yeah, a minute said, and a half. Yep. The numbers yep. are all here and I don't think the numbers really, um, they don't, in a sense, they, all, they, they don't matter, although, of course, from a headline sense, they do, because some of those numbers look a lot higher than um, the sort of um, figures that um, Julie was indicating people were comfortable with. Um, and so the key thing was things like being able to offset the levy rate against the current um, uh, component of income tax that goes towards aged care. So, you know, almost having a net um, nil net effect, um, the challenge being the cost of some of the reforms that the Commission was exploring at the time. So very quickly, just to close off, one of the other topics that really um, was of great interest to the Royal Commission team was what would this mean in terms of uh, cash accumulations or, or reserves as we might know them? And we were really at strong pains to emphasise that this was not a saving scheme. It's more, much more in the nature of an insurance scheme. And therefore, any accumulation of funds was driven purely by differences in cash flow timings rather than any actual accumulation for um, uh, individual sort of savings. Um, and that's touched on in the report, but I think there's a lot more that could be explored there as well. Um, so I'll stop there and um, just hope that that gives people some opportunity for um, questions. So thank you very much for that presentation. It was very interesting. It's all it's all coming together. Um, and next speaker is going to continue on this theme, Professor Mike Sheriffs, who will be examining the issue of sustainable financing of aged care and balancing between the government, tax base and individual contributions. And he'll particularly explore the role of the private market insurance and finance and to supplement aged care. So I think this is another key piece of this puzzle. Um, Professor Sheriffs is a chief investigator at CPAR. He's been a professor in the School of Actuarial Risk and Actuarial Studies at the Business School of UNSW. Um, his research sits at the intersection of actuarial science and financial economics. He's ex published extensively, won a number of best paper awards as a former Australian Actuary of the Year. And um, I'm looking forward to, uh, Mike, you considering this final piece of our little puzzle. Thank you. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for your joining this session this morning. So I'm going to give some broad considerations around sustainable aged care financing. I'll just mention that uh, Jonathan Zavei, uh, Yang Shen, myself, Jeremy Temple, and Aman and Patago have a research grant around healthy ageing and financing healthy ageing, including aged care financing that we've just commenced. And we've had a research student who will be presenting at the colloquium after this session presenting some of the early work around financing aged care in Australia. So let me just say, I'm going to talk briefly about sustainability issues, which has already been raised in this, this session, and also the Royal Commission report and some things that stuck out when I looked at the final recommendations. And then I'll talk a little bit about potential innovations and role of long-term care insurance and equity release. In other words, using private resources to fund contributions to long-term care from, from individuals in a sustainable structure in discussion and Q&A if there's time. Uh, I don't cover this, but at the end of my slides, I have some mention of the research that we've been doing at CPAR around modelling aged care risks, functional disability, and also financing those risks with long-term care insurance and equity release products. We've been working on this for many years, mostly using overseas data in the overseas context. And now we're starting to look more at the Australian context. So obviously we're all familiar with the sustainability issues that have already been mentioned. We expect aged care costs to increase just as the population ages, even in the current climate with constraints on financing of aged care from government. There's a whole bunch of factors that have been recommended to improve home care financing 
Yeah, we've got waiting time for home care packages were quite significant. Eliminating that's going to add to costs. Improved levels of care. We've already seen that levels of home care support packages don't provide that much if you're severely disabled in home care. The high costs of quality care. Staffing levels in residential care need to be improved and paid more, and that's going to become more critical over time. Indexation is important, and that tends to be lagged, and, but it's very important to meet those increasing costs and track high quality staff. Increased preferences for ageing in place, not going into residential care. So at the moment, if you don't get a package, you might end up residential care, and that costs more in any event. And also issues with provider sustainability and the financing they get has uh, highlighted the need for increased financing. There are lessons from overseas schemes, just a, a couple here. That, that I mentioned, the, the Dutch system, for example, once again, we saw rationing in that system, similar to what we see in Australia, increasing waiting lists, deterioration of care. That's something we've seen here. The Japanese system, which moved to a social insurance system, but also had uh, contributions and co-payments and the need there to increase financing. So even with a, a social insurance scheme there, the cost issues are important to be looked at. And the Deloitte modelling in the, the Aged Care Royal Commission highlighted how these costs are going to increase, but it's important not to just look out to 2050. Australia's population is ageing and it goes on ageing and the costs go increasing beyond 2050. You have to look out at least 100 years to capture a full generation. Then from the, the Royal Commission, there was some important uh, recommendations and, and one was around having universal entitlement without the need, for example, for co-payments. And what I'm gonna argue is that there needs to be a balance of individual contributions, government contributions and co-payments when people are uh, receiving aged care subject to means testing. And then the, the funding recommendations from the Royal Commission haven't been adopted by the government are obviously still under consideration, but these are critical for improving quality of aged care, but under-researched and not well understood. And like I said, those things that struck me around Tony Pagani's recommendation, I won't read these here when you read the aged care final report, but the need for proper analysis of the costs, proper projections, actuarially based. I think this is important. We haven't seen that carried out for aged care in Australia. And this is also limited by the amount of data we have and the availability of data for that research is to model aged care risks in Australia. We can do this with overseas data quite well, but in Australia we can't. And it's, it's a very poor situation to be in if we want to understand the costs of this. The, the financing levy proposal idea is important to add to sustainability of the Australian system, but there needs to be a balance. So that's what I'm going to talk briefly about now. So considerations that I think are important. Firstly, having an integrated insurance based model, for not only the assessment and also the payment for care and also the integration of different means of support, recognising informal care and its importance, the, the mix between home care and residential care, rationing of home care shouldn't mean that people will end up in residential care, uh, low levels of support and the home support system over many people may not be providing an adequate level of aged care. But to finance this, care co-payments and incentives to limit moral hazard are important. And lifetime caps are important if you're going to have individuals contributing, then private markets like insurance markets can be used to help finance these care co-payments from those who can afford it. Uh, equitable and sustainable means testing for co-payments are important and consistent with the age pension. At the moment, means testing is very confusing in not only the age pension system, but the aged care system. Integration of the aged care financing with retirement in income and health financing. So this needs as already mentioned, retirement income and the current products that are used for financing retirement income, individuals are going to run out of their, their private superannuation savings by the time they need aged care. And that's probably appropriate, but there are products that can be designed to, to better capture the risks in retirement income products, including additional funding when you need home care. 
They're balancing intergenerational equity. So that's one of the big issues of introducing a levy. So you have to balance that up. You have to look at how that's introduced and that's important. Actuarial-based funding with regular actuarial views is important to ensure funding is adequate. And then the role for private insurance markets and financing mechanisms for individuals who have the resources to fund their care and provide for co-payments in a, in a well-balanced system. So I'll talk briefly about long-term care insurance. So overseas in many countries, there are long-term care insurance markets, private markets. We don't have these in Australia, but for example, if you had a, a system where individuals were contributing co-payments with lifetime cap as, as we do now, uh, and that was across all of the different forms of care and known in advance and understood well in advance, then individual long-term care insurance products for those who could afford could be designed. And having these insurance products can be beneficial to individual welfare and also to society as more generally. Yeah, payments for residential care costs, we know these have to be met if you do move into residential care, ideal for insurance type products. So the products could be designed to help fund these. Obviously these products are only going to be sold to those hitting retirement who meet healthy underwriting standards and the payment triggers often differ a little bit from the way the aged care system works in terms of determining if you qualify for aged care. These are based on activities, daily living or cognitive impairment. And obviously these are not going to be for individuals who are not in good health and not wealthy enough to afford the premiums. And individuals with significant levels of wealth can usually self-insure these risks, particularly if they have housing and other forms of retirement saving. Uh, there are some issues around long-term care insurance that are raised when you, you talk about these markets, often they kind of dismissed, but frictional costs, systematic risks can have impacts and they add to the cost of these products. Adverse selection costs, these have to be basically minimised, managed. Uh, regulatory cost, solvency capital costs can be important for these types of products to manage systematic risks. So you have to be innovative in the design of these products so that these costs are reduced and there are ways to do that. These are areas that we've been researching. For example, loadings, if you have full guaranteed products, life annuities can be 10 to 15%. Half of that might be capital guarantee costs. Uh, Long-term care insurance might have loadings 30 to 40%. Once again, half of that might be around solvency capital guarantee costs. So if you can make a, a, a mutual type product, these loadings can be reduced. Uh, so mutual risk sharing pools, government provided products, economies of scale are also important. So it is possible to design products to meet these requirements to provide cost effective products. So some of the innovations that are possible, long-term care insurance, we've indexed cash benefits, uh, riders to, for example, annuity type products, aged care annuities or combination products that have natural hedging built in are, are cost effective, variable annuities that can provide exposure to equity in a, a retirement type setting with long-term care riders. So you can add these to existing retirement products. Uh, joint life type products also are, are valuable in terms of the way these operate and also mutual, like I mentioned, we're, we're doing quite a bit of research around mutual pooling of risks, including long-term care insurance. Now, equity release, well, we know how important home equity is. It's a significant asset for many Australians. Hitting retirement may not be the, the case in the future, but at the current time, it's a very important source of financing that individuals can use to fund aged care. Now, there are some issues around products that can be used. For example, reverse mortgages in, in Australia, very conservative loan to value ratio. So some of the benefit of reverse mortgages aren't going to be available if you use it earlier on as a way of supplementing retirement income rather than funding, for example, residential costs into aged care. Most of these products at the moment are lump sum versus income type products and also risk-based capital requirements for issuers of these for banks financing it are much higher than for normal loans, so much higher interest rates. Home reversions much more targeted at releasing capital, but these have some issues, particularly with providers who are taking on residential home equity on their balance sheet, 
there are significant capital costs in doing that. So that limits this market as well. So some of the product innovations around equity release products, for example, lump sum reverse mortgages packaged to provide income or long-term care insurance. So if you wanted to fund long-term care insurance to meet your co-payments in a well-designed funding system, then a lump sum reverse mortgage, unlocking your equity could be a way to do that. Having a deferred equity release type product that gets triggered when you move into residential care. So you had some guarantee of funding and you knew that situation in advance. And home reversions, for example, superannuation funds could, with some work, design a product where they could unlock equity in fund members' home and provide a new asset class for members, younger members who would want exposure to residential equity returns. It could be a way of providing the, the funding for those kinds of home reversion products. Uh, so now I'm at the discussion Q&A, and as I've mentioned, there is a session after this where our honours student who've been working on modelling aged care costs and different financing mechanisms, some early work we're doing in our research here. Laura is going to be presenting 11.15 to 11.40 in breakout room 2A, so I highly recommend that. All right, thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks, Mike. That's so thank you for everyone for all your questions, all the presenters for their presentation. This topic is a huge one. It's not going away. And as some people have commented, it's one that's going to need a lot more attention in the future. Um, and uh, it's certainly, I think it leads naturally from some of the work that's been done in retirement incomes. But thank you everyone for your participation.